The reason I wear the hat <laughs> is because I'm actually bald. The size of my shoes are. Is that all right, Ron? What was that? That's all right. Is it all right? Okay, cool. It's like the voice of God. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Speak to me. It's kind of special. It's very, very special. Well, thanks, you know, thanks for coming by because I know you guys are busy and burned out apparently. Like, tired <laughs> no, I'm not tired at all. I just have a sore throat. Mm. But is it, is it, um, you know, has it gotten? It's old? not even sore. It's, it's just gone. It's gone. <laughs> it and doesn't this, hurt. This is from New Orleans. I believe this, this happened in New Orleans was the, was the start of all this. But no, he had, he had miles of decadence preceding New Orleans. <laughs> I think New Orleans was the start of the sore throat, and I think Dallas might have been the apex. <laughs> <laughs> Can we trace the beginning of the decadence, though? No, you'd have to go back to fe fetal stage with him. <laughs> I would have to get, I'd have to bring a box of my tin. You know, you see that picture there. of the, the fetus smoking? You know, the sad, that was him. <laughs> I was actually a star when I was a little star baby. You were a child star. But, uh, yeah, to answer your question, we are, we are very crispy. Very yes. crispy. God. How long have you been on the road now? Well, this is... We have been on the road. Uh, <laughs> This is two months straight, but before that we had done a, a whole American tour, so roughly on and off since June. And a small European thing we did, too. We haven't been home a lot. <laughs> <laughs> been home about 15 days since July 8th or something. Uh, have the songs changed a lot since you've been playing them live so much? More sonic. Yeah, they're a lot They're a lot freer, a lot looser. They're not so anal anymore. They're more of a... We try and, try and get more of a jam atmosphere now as opposed to playing the songs exactly how they are on the record the the real lesson i've learned from playing so much on the road is that it it does everyone a disservice if the band is disinterested in the music it's playing and it's like anything if you do it over and over and over again it just loses its brilliance or brightness or something so we've tried to find ways in the songs to keep our minds in them so so that, you know, we don't want to, I mean, we're not out there to jam, we're not the Grateful Dead, but we've kind of opened up our songs a little bit for a little more interpretation. I think it's really made our shows a lot better, and I think it gives audiences a chance to see more of pers a personality than, like, be like Rush and just get up there and play the, the album. Because I think in the end, that's all people really want to see. I mean, they have the album, they know the songs, I think they just want, they're looking for some other element, so. Right. So what personality of the band do you think? The meanie. The reckless. The reckless meanies. <laughs> like the, the devil may care version of the Smashing Pumpkins? Um, uh, that's a good question. It's just, um, I know we never, see, we, when we formed as a band, we were, we weren't a jammy type band. We, we wrote songs and then brought them to the band. We weren't like that kind of band who f wrote the songs as a jamming band. So, to open it up like we have is kind of a new thing for us. What aspect it brings out of us, it really, it's kind of funny because um, it just depends on night to night, you know. If you're angry, that it's more has more of an edge. And if you're feeling a little more lovey, then it tends to be a little softer in places. It, it, it's the, 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 the best thing about it is it's really an honest interpretation of your feelings filtered through the medium of songs. And by doing that, I think that as just personally, it, it's made my life a lot easier because I don't have to get up and pretend to be something I'm not. If I am angry, I get up and I play my songs angry, and it lends us a, a, a depth to the songs that maybe wouldn't be there if I didn't have those emotions. And conversely, no one's seeing me up there with a propped-up smile, aching to put on rock moves that I don't really believe in, you know? I would have guessed that there was a lot of Not at all. No, no. So, so okay. Let's you know take like bury me. Like that was all worked out. Mm -hmm. and, and yep. That Pretty. song was worked out in every detail. So how does it like who started that one? You know, did you have lyrics and? No, I, I, I That's the bury me type of song. I literally wrote the whole song and just brought it to the band, and then it was just fine tuning. So it's like you come in with chord changes, and this is where the solos go, and then we do this, and then we do exactly. that. Exactly. It. It's not always that way, but it, for a song like that, it, it, it was like that. We're very, we're very specific because 
and this is this is answering a bigger question that you haven't even asked me, but um, what we do specifically musically to us is not it's important in the sense of establishing something else like emotionally so we're more looking for an emotional intangible element than musical so I don't know it's hard to explain how that works with how we make up our songs but so when it's like you know bury me to you is like it, it's this emotion that I want to get across and like you know, um, rhinoceros is a different emotion I don't think it's that specific I think I mean bury, bury me was a very anal song when we when we did it in the studio everything was worked out but I mean I mean, we do it now, and we do it totally different. I mean, there's a totally different feel. I mean, it's not necessarily the same same things that I was feeling in the studio when we did it, or necessarily that Billy was feeling. Well, I don't know. It's 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 really hard to explain because it's it's by being very specific in terms of what everyone is doing in a mechanical sense, it it, it frees the mind up because you know where everyone's you know you know where everyone's going at every specific time. There isn't this kind of, what you do is you create this kind of machine that's all working in one direction, and by doing that, it frees the mind up. And and that's why we're so specific in the way that we write our songs and the way that they're they're meant to be played, so that you can achieve other things. It's 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 a hard concept to explain. To, and, you know, I, I mean, to most people, it's probably really unimportant, you know? No, it's like, I was thinking it's like a, a race car driver that knows exactly every all the little or, or an airplane pilot all the little things that you have to do so then you're open like all those things are just you don't have to worry they're taken care of and you're not constantly fighting each other on stage or while you play the song because somebody's going in a different direction we know as a band exactly what everyone else is going to do and by doing that it, it allows you the freedom to roam in your mind and, and bring out a lot of other things instead of having to stand there and concentrate and worry about what the person next to you is doing all the time. It's like, is somebody, are you a big classical music fan? No. Because no. it's, like it's like a symphony. It's like sort of, it, it's, it goes all over the place, but it's in a very incredibly ordered way. Orchestrated would definitely be the word. Mm. Um, some people um, that have seen that kind of process with us in action are kind of surprised, you know. But I think it's very important because... Uh, the end result is to achieve the maximum effect that you're looking for and nothing about hopefully nothing about what you're doing musically is detracting from that mm -hmm. that's why we were so specific mm -hmm. yeah, makes sense yeah. hmm. Hmm. it's um do the audiences have a big effect Actually, since we're talking about Die Wars they were saying how from like show to show and from city to city what they see in the audience what the people look like and how they react to the first song totally changes like the show from night to night for them and and it, they, they thought way in, in a much bigger way than say if you know they were in Bon Jovi where the crowd probably looks the same from night to night um, there's definitely something about how an audience reacts that has something to do with the band but I think it's really important that a band not get applause happy and reaction happy and that ultimately you have to achieve a satisfaction within your band because playing music that's important to you is shouldn't be about validation it shouldn't be about someone validating your existence and your presence in a, in a club somewhere it should be about your pride and your establishing something to people and some of the best shows we ever we've ever played have been shows where the audience didn't react we didn't get anything from the audience it, it, it's there's no equation there's no simple equation sometimes you play in front of great audiences and the band is horrible you know it definitely pumps you up. It definitely gives you a different high when the audience knows what you're doing, is familiar with the songs, and reacts. But I think ultimately it, you have to shut yourself off to that because what you do is you end up being applause happy and you end up steering your sets and everything you do towards maximum response. And I think, <coughs> I, I think that's the wrong thing to do. When you first started playing music, did it sound anything like the Smashing Pumpkins? Nope. Absolutely not. No. So, so what, you were, you were playing a drums along to bad pop songs bad pop songs <laughs> like like bad pop songs like but you wanted to be a drummer did you want to be like I think I roll? think she's asking you from the beginning like yeah. pre-pumpkin yeah pre-pumpkin um I actually wanted to be a lumberjack <laughs> <laughs> and 
Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, a, a far out mystical thing to want to be. Right, he was a special child. <laughs> um, I mean, I just wanted to play music that I liked, you know. And I mean, whether I'm whether I'm in the Pumpkins or whatever, I'm just. I mean, the fact that I can do it now and, and make somewhat of a living is a great thing but I mean it's not it's not the most important thing to me I just if I didn't like the music I wouldn't be in the band always as simple as that always drums though did you always want to be always been a drummer yeah since I was eight years old I I mean I play other instruments too but I mean drums is definitely the thing I like best <laughs> I mean better than anything else in my life I like to play my drums so I guess, yeah. So you were terrorizing your family from third grade on. <laughs> well, yeah, but my brother was a drummer before that, oh, so <laughs> they went through Happy about family. 22 years of drums. <laughs> <laughs> but they're proud now. <laughs> yeah, but none of them can hear. <laughs> <laughs> they would like it if they could hear it. Yeah. God. How much, well, from the time the pumpkins got together till now, did the music go through a lot of different changes? Absolutely. So when the, when the band was coming together, what, what were you saying to each other? We want a band that, See, that wants. I, I guess to answer the question you're asking me, I'd have to say that the pumpkins were formed more on a theoretical idea than a musical idea. The idea was to, to be able to create an environment of a band that could allow you the freedom to do whatever you wanted to do, to express yourself whatever way you wanted to express yourself, if that meant blasting out or if that meant being very subtle. So those being like the, the basic parameters, we set about to find comfortable musical styles for ourselves that w were more instinctual and not necessarily related to trends or or anything like that. So in in the early in the early process of the band it was just kind of like okay, here's a good song I wrote. We'd play it and then we realized we weren't comfortable with it as a band. It wasn't the ultimate direction we wanted to head. So it just became a process of weeding out where we were comfortable. To 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 say we we wanted to do whatever we wanted to do sounds simple. But to be a band and get on stage and play really heavy songs and then turn around and play really mellow songs is a really hard thing to do. And to establish a gracefulness from from that, those extremes was really difficult. So it took us really a couple years to feel really comfortable with, you know, the the two symbolic sides of the band. Um, it's really it's really a strange thing because. You know, you, when you first start a band, you reach for things that are comfortable. You reach for things that you understand. Just like anything, you, you're going to go with what's around you that's easy to understand. And as we've gone along, we've shed all those things. Literally everything that we started with, we've shed them all and f like followed our instincts. So as we go along more and more, influences mean less. It's like we don't even really, you know, it's just what comes out because there's like this process established of what we are and how we are so now it, everything that comes out kind of filters through this thing it's most of my friends that play in bands say that we're not like any other band i don't mean musically necessarily but how we act and the way we come about what we do is very kind of backwards but i think i think that was really necessary the process we went through to, to become what we are now um, you know, because it wasn't like a, it wasn't like God spoke to me and said, you know, you're going to be in this band and it's going to sound like this. You know, it, it was arrived at by a lot of trial and error and, and just finding what you're, you're instinctually comfortable with. And it, well, plus it's also, you know, you're pretty close to uncategorizable. That makes me very happy to hear that. I, that's what I want. We've reached this zenith point in music where it's like everyone's heard everything. You know, you can't, you can't, you can't out solo Jimi Hendrix, and you can't out God Led Zeppelin, and you can't out Iggy Pop, Iggy Pop, and you you know you everything has reached its point where it's like you can't be any more whatever unless you're going to kill yourself on stage, and that would be a one-time act, you know. That's really the last thing left to do, and so it's like there's a frustration there of just like where do we go, where do we head? I don't want to be a regurgitating retro let's mishmash the past up and deliver it to someone in a different box and pretend that it's different. We don't want to do that. So we're really trying to find some kind of area that's 
you know so that's why when i say we it's 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 more about emotion for us than it is about music in a lot of ways because musically how much how many different ways can you really express yourself so that we look for something that will mean more in some other way <laughs> no, you can't out pop Iggy. You know? Can't out pop Iggy. Can't out God. Led Zeppelin. What makes you write? Or, or what's your? You know, are you always working on lyrics, or is it? Yeah. There, you know, do we have notebooks and notebooks and notebooks that get carried around mm -hmm. and cassettes? Yeah. And, and scribbles. Exactly. Um, as long as I can remember, it's always been a process of like creation for me. You know, from like scribbling, drawing, writing, poem. You know. You name it, it's always been about expression, so being in a rock band is, for me, the ultimate way to express myself, because I can express myself in a, a very aesthetic way, which is to make records, and then I can also express myself in a way that's very personable, live. Um, you know, maybe rock and roll is disposable at some level, but as far as like for the moment, it's probably the best art form, you know, because it's alive and it's, it breathes. You know, maybe maybe no one will listen to our you know our tapes in a hundred years, and they'll have somebody's painting on the wall. But you know, as long as I'm alive, at least I feel that I'm doing something that's like breathing. Are you a writer before you're a musician? Um, I definitely wrote a lot of poetry and stuff like that. I don't know if it was good or bad, but it just it was just always this impulse to want to do something. You know. Was it hard getting the band together, getting the personalities together? Was there a lot of trying this person, trying that person, coming and going in? And, Absolutely. The, the hardest part was was saying to someone, okay, okay, you're going to form this band, and this is how it's going to be, you know. And, the, and they would say, well, what kind of band is, you know, what kind of music? Well, no, no, you don't understand. It's more about an idea, you know. And to find people who are willing to accept that challenge and be willing to kind of not go for such an immediate accessible thing and to be willing to just put in time and years and and really work at it and really believe in this idea that somehow we were going to achieve something that was bigger and better than everything that was around us being from chicago it was just such a frustrating music scene you know it gave us all the more impetus to want to grow beyond that i went through so many people trying to find the right people and a lot of people like the idea of being in a band more than they actually like working mm -hmm. for a band. It's a gang with guitars, you know, it's just sort of yeah. different, different social group. Exactly. Yeah. So how did you, what did, what did, like, what made you know it was going to work? Like, what was said, what was played, and you said, yeah, I like this person, I want to be... Nobody really likes each other, but we all... <laughs> <laughs> Bond together. <laughs> well, it's definitely the music. I mean, it's definitely the feeling. I mean, nobody. I mean, would you be nobody in the, in the band? I don't think anybody in the band is actually like best friends per se. But I mean, everybody. I think everybody knows that they're going to be in the band forever. E even if the even if the band breaks up at some point, which it will, we'll give the band up. It's like. Kind of, kind of like being in the Mouseketeers, you know? Once a pumpkin, always a pumpkin. We've really subjugated ourselves to this idea of how things should be. And when it really comes right into your face is when you try to play with someone else. You yeah. try to go outside and play with some other musician, you realize how intent, intense you are with <coughs> what you do and how you do it. We have such a kind of a psychic process that goes on now. That's really a strange thing. What song, what's an album you might both have in your record collection? Like what's something that could be like an old Bond, you know, like what? Like Led Zeppelin 2? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, between me and Billy, we've probably got every Zeppelin, Hendrix, Sabbath. King Crimson? No. no. I've got some King Crimson. I knew, I knew there were some King Crimson. I'm like the, I, was, I was once the anal drummer. Um, <laughs> Now he's the oral drummer. Yeah, I'm sure you've been asked this a billion times, and I'm sorry, but why is rhinoceros called rhinoceros? Um, or, or, or I never, I never talk about what my songs are about, because not about what the song, or, or okay. Well, that, but that kind of is talking about okay. what the song's about. 
Well, I thought, okay, then you could just answer this. Like, Here, I'll, I'll explain. Okay. I'll, I'll explain to you. Um, this is how I arrive at my song titles in, in a lot of ways, and this kind of is indicative of how I arrived at Rhinoceros. Say you have, uh, you write a song about a chandelier, and the chandelier gives off light, and the light is the color red, and red reminds you of the color you're not supposed to wear around a bull. So you name the, the song Cow. <laughs> So now, you, so now you know. That all makes sense. Yeah. That's perfect. That's perfect. Well, then there's the other thing of um, you know, Joy Division makes up a list of great phrases. And then after the album's finished, they just all go through and pick up, you know, they pick ten phrases, words, whatever, and they put those in the top. I thought, no, that might be, mm -hmm. that might be something that I like that. So now I can, can like sort of figure things out. It's good. I, it's good. I, think, I think song titles are really important. It's kind of like um, the wrapping paper on a gift. Do you ever start with a title? Absolutely. Sometimes I, ca I, ca I to be totally honest, I carried Shiva around in my head for like five years. That I knew I was going to write a song one day called Shiva. I, I just knew. I have, I have tapes from five years ago with Shiva written out. You know, like, like trying to put that title to a song, you know. Like blank tapes, you were just like you'd be ready. Exactly. I even thought of calling the band Shiva, actually. Wow. And it finally came out. It, it finally, finally came, came out. out. Together with the right combination of people. So now I have these other new songs called Kill Mom and <laughs> <laughs> Shoot Dad and Decadence in New Orleans. Yeah. And I love the, the, the Sacred Heart on the phone. Who's the who's the inspiration? Who's who found the picture? Um Actually, it's an actual like. One of the little. It's actually like a. It's like an ornament. Ornament or or. What's the word? I used to wear it around my neck. Oh. It was given to me by a woman in Florida when I was 19. It was this strange um, thing I had. You know, it's like um. You know, sometimes when they shoot a rocket, you know, and it's supposed to go straight up, and it kind of goes to the left. That's kind of what that was all about. I kind of I kind of went off for a while. Do you still, I mean, do you still have it? <laughs> yeah, it's it's actually my girlfriend's. I gave it to her, and I actually had to pry it out of her to use it for the album. But <laughs> 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 it's, it's a wonder. I mean, it's just such a wonderful image. I was thinking, there's a. Have you guys been to Boston yet? Mm -hmm. Lately? Sure. Did you, there's um at the Boston Museum of it's like their equivalent of, of modern art. Like they're mm -hmm. they've got um. It's called. It's all in Spanish, or it's half in Spanish, and it's all. Um, it's all bleeding hearts. It's like this wonderful, really? emotional exhibit. That to me is it's just like. Whew, I mean, it's it's you know, very very. It's like the heaviest thing you'll ever see right. in a museum uh, in life. The, the sacred heart image or the bleeding heart image to me is like, it's like the the image I attach myself to. Like a lot of people are into crosses or, that to me is the ultimate image. You know, the soul of of God and you know and then it's just such a dualistic image you know it has fire and thorns and you know it says so much to me and I just I just thought it was just right and it, it is in a way it really says I mean that it, in some ways that should have been the front cover you know that that image just because that pretty much symbolically is the album mm -hmm. that kind of torture at first I was trying to link Gish with the heart and I thought I just mm -hmm. couldn't, couldn't then I was thinking of what, what she was like and maybe what she went through and I thought well mm -hmm. there was like some link there and then Gish, Gish sounds just like such a sentimental word yeah it's like you know it's so something something yeah Gish it's <laughs> like the it girl or something I don't know uh -huh. it's, just, it's all smiles Gish is such a smiley word yes it and is and the back is so intense and so mm -hmm. rip you open that pretty much sums up the pumpkins, you know. <coughs> yeah. Just, just when you think we're, we're getting soft on you, kind of hit you over the head, you know. Uh, well, great. I'm glad you guys came by. Thanks for having it's us. Two minutes after four. How am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> Can I have you do liners? What is that? You know, oh. Insert your name here. Okay. I never do these, but for you, I will oh, do them. Do them for me. Do them for me. Uh, 
And, and if you don't get to go to Boston, a friend is sending me the, there was a book. That You're came kidding. Out. No. I they, have a friend in Boston, maybe. Oh, it's it's the Boston. It's, the, it's like their museum of modern art. You just need to do the on the edge. No. You can read them and you can do, uh, you know, I'm Billy and I'm Jimmy and Smashing Pumpkins and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Howdy there, folks. I'm Billy from the Smashing Pumpkins. I'm on the edge, can't you tell? Right after this, so stay tuned. Cool. Yes, life on the edge. I'm William Patrick Corgan from the Smashing Squids, and we'll be back right with some of our music. <laughs> I always think these are so silly, so I'm sorry. Well, I know, but see, the, people, the only thing people hear is, is you, and this oh. is like at the beginning and at the top of the show, so they won't know what's going on. Hey, I'm back. I'm on the edge. <laughs> Been taking a lot of these pills. I'm Billy from the Pumpkins, and we're on the edge. Get it? Let's make, let's make Jimmy do something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I am really on the edge. <laughs> so when your voice comes back, I'll just send you this, and you go, God, that's what he's like. It's very good. It's very kind of like Robert Mitchum or something. I don't know. More like, more like Vic Tayback. <laughs> Alice. <laughs> yeah, light another cigarette. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jimmy from the Smashing Pumpkins. I'm on the edge. Right after this, so stay tuned. Hi, this is Jimmy from the Pumpkins. Nobody rocks Southern California like one. <laughs> oh, you're reading the wrong one. <laughs> I can't see the. I you can't see these. the highlighter. You gotta read. You gotta read these. You read that one though. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I can't see the highlighter. <laughs> he had his heart set on saying power radio. They're all on the edge. <laughs> on the edge. I'm Jimmy from the Pumpkins. Back with our music. We're back on the edge. I'm Jimmy from the Pumpkins. <laughs> you can't use any of these. These are terrible. Hi, I'm Edge from you too. <laughs> You're on the Pumpkins. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> the Pumpkins are my favorite. Don't go anywhere. Oh, very funny. This is a great record. Oh, thank you. It's really, really good. I promise the next one will be better. Really? Rhinoceros and Bury Me are my favorite songs. Really? Yeah. yeah. You know, the funny thing about that record, I mean, this makes me very happy, is everyone I talk to likes different, different songs. Different songs. That's good. I mean,